Hello, everyone. Welcome to our session today, Action Working Group. My name is Xin Yang. I work at VMware by Broadcom in the cloud native storage team. I'm also a co-chair of the Kubernetes Six Storage and the Data Protection Working Group, working with Dave. Hi, I'm Dave Smith Uchida. I work at Veeam. You may also know us as Kasten. We do Kubernetes backup, and uh, formerly I was on the Valero project. So here's today's agenda. First, we will talk about what we did in this working group, who are involved, and we will talk about what is the motivation for establishing this working group, what are the projects that we are working on, and finally, how to get involved. Here are some of the key updates. We wrote a white paper that describes the data protection workflow in Kubernetes. And here are some links to our previous talks at KubeCon. Here are some of the companies who are supporting this working group. In Kubernetes, day one operations for stable workloads are well supported. We have persistent volumes and persistent volume claims to support volume operations. We have workload APIs such as SafeSet deployment to do declarative uh, management of your workloads. According to a 2022 survey by Data on Kubernetes community, more and more stable workloads are moving to Kubernetes. These workloads move into Kubernetes to take advantage of Kubernetes self-healing abilities, agile deployment, the building scalability, and portability. On the other hand, day two operations for stable workloads, such as data protection, are still limited. GitOps workflows has limited support for data protection, such as secrets, config maps, and data stored in persistent volumes are not stored in the Git. So we need to find a better way to support data protection in Kubernetes. That's why we established this working group back in 2020. And this working group is supported, sponsored by both uh, SIG apps and SIG storage. This diagram shows the backup workflow with existing and missing building blocks in Kubernetes. To backup an application in Kubernetes, we need to backup two pieces of data. The first one is Kubernetes uh, metadata, and the second one is data stored in persistent volumes. To backup data in persistent volumes, we can either use the native data dump, such as MySQL dump, or we could use controller co coordinated approach while a volume snapshot is taken. To ensure application consistency, we need to quiesce the application before taking a snapshot and unquiesce afterwards. And uh, both the metadata and volume data will be exported to a backup repository. Backup repository is a location of repo to store data and metadata. And we have a few green blocks here. They represent the existing features in Kubernetes. We have the application CRD owned by SIG apps. We have volume snapshot owned by SIG storage. We also have COSI, consistent group snapshot, and volume mode conversion, which I will go over later. This shows the restore workflow with the existing and missing building blocks in Kubernetes. To do a restore, first we need to import the backup from the backup repository. Then we need to restore the Kubernetes metadata and the PVC and PV. Depends on how the volume was backed up. If it's backed up natively, then we need to restore from the native data dump. Otherwise, we need to rehydrate the PVC from volume snapshot or volume backup. We mentioned earlier that to ensure application consistency, we need to quiesce the application before taking a snapshot. 
But what if it is not possible to quiesce the application, or if it is uh, too expensive to quiesce the application, so you want to do it less frequently, but you still want to be able to do a crash consistent snapshot more frequently. An application may contain multiple volumes, and that require a snapshot to be taken at the same point in time across all the volumes. There is also a performance element there. It will be much more efficient if you can take a snapshot as, as one step across all the volumes compared to taking one snapshot at a time. So that's how consistent group snapshot comes into the picture. We introduced the new Kubernetes APIs that allows us to create a snapshot of multiple volumes that belong to the same application at the same point in time to ensure right order consistency. We have new control logic in the snapshot controller that manages the life cycle of volume group snapshots. We also have CSI spec changes. Now we actually have a new group controller service, and we added the new gRPC interfaces to create, delete, and get volume group snapshots. Here are API examples. We have a volume group snapshot that uh, is in the user namespace that represents a user's request for a group snapshot. We have volume group snapshot content that represents a snap group snapshot on the storage backend. We also have volume group snapshot class that specifies the type of uh, group snapshot that's defined by the admin. To create a volume group snapshot, first you need to uh, def decide what other PVCs you want to be snapshotted together apply a label specifying the volume group snapshot name on those PVCs. And in the volume group snapshot CR, specify the volume group snapshot class name and a label selector, making sure that it matches the label you added to the PVCs. After a volume group snapshot is created, a volume group snapshot content will be created uh, with a volume group snapshot handle pointing to a resource on their storage backend. Volume group snapshot and volume group snapshot content have one-to-one -one mapping. As a result of creating a volume group snapshot, individual volume snapshots will be created. Each one is corresponding to, a, uh, to the original source PVC, and you can use that to create a new PVC. This feature was introduced in 1.27 release, and we are now trying to move it to beta in 1.32. In the CSS spec, this feature is already moved from alpha to GA. We are trying to cut a CSS spec release after KubeCon. There are uh, quite a few contributors working on this feature. I want to give a shout out to Ronak Neos, Leonardo, Yari, Manish, and Madhu for their hard work. Next, I want to talk about a backup repository. A backup repository is a repo or location that you can use to store data and metadata. It can be NFS or object storage or other type of uh, storage type. It can be on-prem or in the cloud. As mentioned earlier, there are two pieces of uh, data that we need to back up. There is the Kubernetes metadata and the data stored in persistent volumes. So uh, they all need to be backed up and saved in this uh, backup repository so that we can use them at the restore time. There is a project called Cozy Container Object Storage Interface that tries to um, add support for object storage in Kubernetes. Cozy provides Kubernetes APIs to provision object buckets and allow those buckets to be consumed by the pods. 
COSI also defines gRPC interfaces so that an object storage provider can write the driver to provision buckets. There are multiple COSI components. There is a controller manager that binds the COSI created buckets to the bucket claims. There is a COSI sidecar that watches COSI Kubernetes API objects and communicates with the COSI driver. There is the COSI driver that communicates with the object storage backends to provision the buckets. There are two sets of Kubernetes APIs. The relationship between bucket, bucket claim, and bucket class are very similar to that for uh, PV, PVC, and storage class. We also have APIs that allows a bucket to be accessed by a pod. As shown here, a bucket claim is a user's request for a bucket. And a bucket CR that's, uh, that represents a physical bucket on the storage backend. Uh, bucket and bucket claim, they have a one-to-one -one mapping to each other. Bucket class uh, describes the type of a bucket that is defined by the admin. In the bucket access class, we specify the type of uh, authentication. And in the bucket access, we specify bucket access class name, a bucket claim name, and credentials. To use COSI, user creates a pod with the project the volume pointing to the secret that is specified in the bucket access. The secret stored in uh, the secret contains the bucket info. The secret is mounted at the specified location. This uh, COSI was introduced in 1.25 release. And now the team is working on moving to V1 Alpha 2. Um, so Blaine and uh, Matthews are working very hard on this project. We also have a few new contributors. If you are a object storage vendor, you're welcome to write a COSI driver. If you are interested in contributing to COSI, please join our weekly standout meetings on Thursdays. Now let me talk about volume mode conversion. In Kubernetes, you can create a PVC from a volume snapshot, and you can change the volume mode from uh, file system to block, or vice versa. However, that might introduce vulnerability to the kernel. On the other hand, this workflow is needed for efficient backups, as shown in this uh, diagram. The original PVC has the file system volume mode. A backup software creates a uh, volume snapshot from that PVC, and then create a temporary PVC from that volume snapshot while changing the volume mode from file system to block so that it can retrieve change blocks for efficient backups. Uh, today, we'll talk more about the change block tracking later. So uh, to prevent the potential security problem, but uh, in the same time to support this uh, workflow, we introduced this feature to prevent unauthorized volume mode conversion. We added a new field source volume mode in volume snapshot content. An annotation allow volume mode change needs to be added on the volume snapshot content in order uh, for this to happen. If you are trying to create a PVC from a volume snapshot while changing the volume mode, but without setting this annotation, this request will be rejected. This feature moved to GA in 1.30 release. The feature flag is enabled by default in the external snapshotter and external provisioner. If your application is depending on this uh, workflow, uh, action is required. Otherwise, your application will fail. Uh, 
Ronak is the developer who has been working on this feature. Now let me hand it over to Dave, who will talk about CBT. Hi, Xing. So change block tracking is basically the ability to find out what's happened between two snapshots, so which blocks have been changed. And like, for example, here we have uh, you know, our snapshot at T1, and then blocks 2, 6, 8, and 9 got changed uh, by the time we came to the second snapshot. So by being able to get this data out, we can actually do a much more efficient backup. So, Quite often, we want to do block-level backups, where we simply copy all of the blocks out of the device. But that also means that you're often copying a lot of blocks you don't want. You wind up doing a full backup every time. So many storage systems will keep track of the changes between snapshots. And that allows us to simply go through and pick the blocks that have changed and back those up. The difficulty has been that all of those uh, APIs are vendor-specific. So we've been working, this has been our major project in the data protection working group for the last year or so to get a standard API that's Kubernetes native put together. And this gives us uh, space, space efficient backups, uh, less network overhead because we're not moving as much data. Uh, because we can do backups more rapidly, it lowers the RPO. So. What were the goals for the change block tracking? So we wanted to do this with the, the CSI spec. Uh, we wanted to hit all of our Kubernetes security standards. Those were quite a few things we had to work on. And then one of the things we ran into was simply overloading the API server with moving a large amount of data through it. So even though the, um, the change block tracking data is much smaller, uh, for things like a one terabyte volume, worst case, so this is, for example, like every other block got changed, we could wind up with about five gigabytes of change block data. And that's simply more than we wanted to push through the API server, and it's more than we wanted to try to store into resources. So that, that will push the design, as you'll see in a moment. Uh, what we're not doing at the moment is we don't have a data path. So the path for retrieving the blocks is still cloning the volume and then attaching it, but you'll know which blocks to copy. And we're also not uh, tracking at the file level. So this is strictly at the block level at this point. So how would you use change block tracking? Um, we have two modes. There's a change block info, where you'd have two snapshots, and you ask what's the difference between these two. There's also another mode where you simply get which blocks have been allocated, and that you only need one snapshot. So that's useful, for example, like on a first backup or a full backup, you can say, I'm backing up everything, but not stuff that's never been written. And in order to avoid pushing all this data, through the API server, there's a separate gRPC endpoint that the snapshot metadata service provides. That's where the actual metadata, uh, the change block tracking info, is streamed from. In order to get access to that, you need to create a token via the token request API. That's a standard Kubernetes API. And then you'll use the gRPC get metadata delta to get the, the change blocks between the two snapshots. There's the other call is get metadata allocated to get only those blocks that were written. And then you would clone or attach the snapshot, and clone and attach the snapshot and read the blocks from it. So looking at this a little more graphically, we have the backup system here. First thing it does, it goes out, gets a token, then it goes ahead and uses the token to try to attach to the gRPC service. The gRPC service goes up, verifies the token, gets the authentication back, and then um, it goes ahead and pulls up the snapshot IDs out of the resource, pushes down to the CSI driver, and so each CSI driver needs to implement that part of it, and then starts streaming the change block list back out. So working on this are, have been uh, Prasad Gongol, Carl Berganza, who's here in the audience, uh, Daniel Fedotov, and Ivan Sim. We've uh, merged the KEP in 1.31. We have an implementation in progress in uh, targeting alpha in 1.32. And then we have a number of vendors who are participating in this. And we're looking for other storage vendors who are interested in this, and certainly other backup vendors who are interested in using this. Or there may be, you know, there's lots of other uses for this, for like example, for replication. So what else are we doing in the working group? 
So one of our other projects right now is we're starting a new white paper on what are best practices for Kubernetes applications to prepare for backup and data protection. And this is one of those things where um, it helps if you know, people write to certain or do certain things in order to make their, their application ready for a backup and restore. So for example, like a, single, a simple app with say a single PVC, we can just snapshot that currently and we'll get what should be a crash consistent uh, backup. So when we restore, it's as though the pod had been restarted violently and it needs to recover from whatever hap you know, what, do you have FSCK and any type of um, application specific repair. But then with multiple PVC volumes, it becomes harder because we've got inconsistencies between the volumes. And so the consistent group snapshot helps a bit there, but we still need to set that up and do that. Um, other options are to have the application ha um, apply a, uh, provide a hook, or we can quiesce and unquiesce the application while we're backing it up. Or we can have it do things like application level backups, where, for example, we do a PG dump to get Postgres to dump all of its information out. But what we don't have right now is we don't necessarily have standards for how to access this, so each application is a little different. And so, you know, making the awareness on this, I think, is going to be very important in the white paper. The other thing that we've run into has been operator-driven applications. And these are things like, you know, there's a Postgres operator, for example, and you write a CR to say, hey, I want a Postgres database. It goes ahead and stands one up for you, creates PVCs, all this stuff, tunes it appropriately. This is all great. Now you do a backup of this by, for example, snapping and exporting all of the disks, when you go to restore, you have to do the order of restore correctly because if, for example, you uh, restore the operator, it comes up and starts running, and then you restore the CR that said, I want a Postgres database, the operator very happily goes out and creates a new empty database. And now it starts fighting with the backup app as we try to push, um, as we try to push volumes back in. So those are some of the things we want to address in this. We're really looking for participation and input on this from application developers, storage system vendors, users, pretty much everybody. Other things that are going on, we've got discussions on how we do uh, remote replication. Many storage systems will do volume group replication, but we also want to look at what's going on beyond that, for example, at the Kubernetes resources and um, being able to configure an application to handle remote rep replication. You know, like if we have, for example, at Postgres again, but two Postgres databases that we want to have talk to each other and replicate to each other. Having standard patterns and APIs where we can configure this will make life much easier. And then we want to work on just overall applications for what a uh, resilient application looks like across multiple Kubernetes clusters. So we encourage you to get involved. Uh, the homepage is up there. We have meetings every two weeks at 9 Pacific on Wednesday, and we have the meeting recordings available. There's a mailing list, and there's also a Slack channel. And I think with that, that is the end of our presentation. We're happy to take any questions. Uh, all right, great presentation, folks. So I just wanted to look into the resource, the PVC resource that was presented after volume group snapshot discussion. I just wanted to see how we can recover from volume group snapshot. So if we have volume snapshot, we can just create a PVC specifying that volume snapshot as a source. But how things happen in case of volume group snapshot is what I wanted to see. Okay, so you want to go back and see exactly how we do the, like this one. Basically, you just need to specify a data, uh, your volume snapshot as a data source. And you create a PVC file. Basically, you, you, you can only divide a time. We don't really have a API that for you to uh, restore all of them at the same time. 
Right. So if we create volume snapshot group or volume group snapshot, does it eventually create multiple volume snapshots as well? Yes. OK, all right. I think I, I missed that somewhere. Oh, OK, yeah. yeah. Um, great presentation, guys. Thank you for that. Um, I have this question about, there's been conflict about applications or stateful applications like databases doing their own backups and snapshotting. And now we are trying to push that towards the storage side to do periodic snapshots and backups. Uh, how do you think these two will play with each other? Applications sometimes are sensitive to uh, storage level snapshots. They cannot recover gracefully from them. So what are your thoughts on that? So it's really not a matter of pushing towards volume snapshots. Volume snapshots are a useful tool. And I think what we're trying to move towards eventually, see, the, the, the challenge becomes you've got a Kubernetes namespace or cluster with a whole bunch of different applications running. And an application, well, an, an application may consist of a number of applications. It's kind of a composite. So say you have two databases, and they each have their own backup mechanism. This is fine. But then you need a way to like orchestrate their backups together. If you just put them both on their own schedules, they may not actually be in sync with each other. So that's where I would like to see us building out more APIs where we can have orchestrators that are able to look at your Kubernetes environment and say, OK, here is a Mongo database. And I know that I can talk to Mongo and do a quiesce and then go ahead and have it dump things out. And here's a, an application I know nothing about, but it has persistent volumes. So we're just going to go ahead and snapshot those. So that's, that's kind of where I see it. It's not really an either or type thing. Um, and, and sometimes you may look at it and you may just say, you know, it's more efficient to do a volume level backup than it is to use the tools backup itself. But that's, that's a case by case basis. Does that help? Hello. Uh, you mentioned a new white paper that you're working on, which I'm personally really excited about. Do you have any already existing white papers where we can go to learn more? Yeah, we do have one, uh, which we actually mentioned that quite earlier. Don't want to go at the, be at the beginning, but yeah, we do have white paper that's already published. Uh, if you just go to the end to our. That. Yeah, so it should be on our home page. Oops. Ah. Yeah, just the, how do you get it? What, what's this do? Yeah, this one. If you go to the commun our community home page, you can already see. Yeah. No, I don't want to know what's new in Chrome. <laughs> Let's see. So is this it? Yeah, so you'll find everything here in our, uh, in our website. And we've got the white paper. It's relatively complete. So if you want to know, for example, like do you need data protection, it's definitely worthwhile to take a look through it. Not all Kubernetes apps do, but many, many do. And sometimes state has crept in in ways that you may not be aware of. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks for the question. I had a question on um, zero downtime is something that we're often seeking. And quiescing is sort of entirely opposite of that. And so. Is there a move to try to figure out a mode to do that within Kubernetes for volume snapshotting? Like, is there a way of that you guys are? Well, so, so volume snapshotting doesn't require quiescing, but you do have to be able to recover from a crash consistent right. backup. And so with the uh, consistency group, that should you know, lessen the need for quiescing. But I think we need like the storage system to support the consistency group, right? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, you check the storage system. Okay, but yeah, so that that's kind of the goal. I know you know when we're working at VMware, VM snapshots, um, you know, time sensitivity becomes a real issue. Oh yeah, yeah. All right, thanks. Sure. Well, thanks for the question. Mm -hmm. 
sure. You mean to have like a, uh, um, to have like a way to call that? Yes. So, or we could call it a blueprint. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I think that's, those would definitely be useful. And the, I think the challenge is to start exposing those in a standard way so that a backup app doesn't have to be, you know, specially coded or configured for each of the different applications. That's what I want, but, you know, I'm, you know, architecture abstractions up in the sky, right? <laughs> Okay, I think we're out of time. So thanks, everybody. Thank you.